Prize Sunday 10, won't you please give a warm welcome to Dr. Helen Delaney. Wow, Sunday 10. Yeah, this is home. This will always be home. Always. <laughs> well, it's so good to be back and to see everybody. Well, for our visitors, handouts for the message are under the pew in front of you. If you want to grab one for your personal notes, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sunday morning. And thank you, Lord, for the chill that's in the air. And as you invigorate us, Lord, we just ask that you would be glorified this morning. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to spend with my brothers and sisters as we just chew on your word. And as always, Lord, I just ask that Helen would decrease and that the spirit of God would increase in this place. And that we would all leave with just one little nugget that perhaps will propel us on into eternity. And we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Well, you know, our culture rarely leads us to a more active faith. And most of us struggle to stay focused on the basics. But what if what I believe could cost me everything? Well, this weekend, we're going to answer that question by going back to the basics in an unusual kind of way. As we pick up our study of the Gospel of Luke, Chapter 12, verses 8 through 12. You see, before the world is ever going to take Jesus seriously, then we, the church, must take Jesus seriously. And before the world is ever converted to a lifestyle devoted to Jesus Christ, then we, the church, must be converted to a lifestyle devoted to Jesus Christ. Mother Teresa was once asked, what advice do you have for a young Christian? And she said, follow Jesus and not the Jesus of people's imaginations. So we have to rediscover the Jesus who calls us to follow him in servanthood and in sacrifice and in maybe, just maybe, some persecution. Let's begin by looking at our scripture for today. Now, this is a very familiar passage for most of us. It's the one that talks about the consequences of acknowledging or denying Jesus before others and the penalty of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But we're going to read it from the Message Bible. So let's stand for the reading of God's word. Stand up for me among the people you meet, and the Son of Man will stand up for you before all God's angels. But if you pretend you don't know me, do you think I'll defend you before God's angels? If you badmouth the Son of Man out of misunderstanding or ignorance, that can be overlooked. But if you are knowingly attacking God himself, taking aim at the Holy Spirit, that won't be overlooked. When they drag you into their meeting places or into police courts and before judges, don't worry about defending yourselves, what you will say or how you will say it. The right words will be there. The Holy Spirit will give you the right words when the time comes. You may be seated. Now, if I had to give a title to my message this weekend, it would be When the Heat is On. And we see from our scripture verses that we are called to put everything that we have on the line for Jesus and our relationship with his Father in heaven. But what we need to be careful of and aware of is to make sure we're not compromising the message of Jesus or reducing it to a comfortable Christianity. And that leads us to the following two warnings and an encouragement to explore when we're under fire. The first warning is the importance of acknowledging or standing up for Jesus when the heat is on. The second warning is to recognize the crossing of a red line with God, especially when we are under pressure. And then we are encouraged with how to respond correctly when we are under fire. 
Now, let's look at each of these based on Jesus' teachings in verses 8 through 12 of Luke 12. Now, do you tend to acknowledge or deny Jesus around others? You see, we have an identity crisis today, and verses 8 and 9 spell it out. With our first warning on your handout, the importance of acknowledging or standing up for Jesus. Have you ever heard people say, you know, my faith is private or I don't like to talk about my faith? Well, I came this morning to tell you our faith is never private because we are on a public mission. So how do we acknowledge Jesus? Well, we have two ways. First, with our words. All of us know that if we know Jesus, we have a testimony to share. In other words, others need to hear and see how our life is different before Jesus and after Jesus. And second, with our lifestyle. Too often our priorities and our lifestyles are out of sync with that of Jesus's. Changing the world and conforming to it are two very different endeavors. In fact, you cannot do both. One absolutely negates the other. But we also need to realize that just living a Christ-like life isn't enough either. Because people today will not make the connection between our good deeds and our faith. We have to make that connection for them. It is through our love of serving others and putting them first that acknowledges Jesus in our lives. But the real truth of acknowledging him in our lives is when the heat is on. And that is where the true rubber meets the real road. So how do you live your life out in the real world when you're under pressure? In other words, how do you live your life at work or at school? If we're not living a Christ-like life in front of the world, doing our highs and our lows, then we're perhaps being deceitful or somewhat hypocritical. It's not how we live our lives inside these four walls that determines our real testimony. But it's outside of these walls that says we really accept, confess, and acknowledge that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, especially when the heat is on. And it's not because we can't, but it's usually because we won't. However, if we don't acknowledge Jesus when we're among others, then don't expect him to acknowledge us before his Father in heaven. And that's a fair trade, right? Absolutely. So our eternal destination is determined by who knows us and who is willing to stand up for us when and where it really counts, and that would be where in heaven. Next. Our second warning on your handout is to recognize the crossing of a red line with God, especially when we are under pressure. Now, crossing a red line is a term that's used worldwide to mean a point of no return or a limit past which safety can no longer be guaranteed. You see, if we are honest about our actions when the heat is on, our first response might not always be so godly. And we can come close to crossing that red line with God. Now, you might hear people say, I'm mad at God or shake their fists at him. And even though that behavior is a really scary thought for me, it might not be that scary for others. But nevertheless, if we find ourselves angry or bad-mouthing God, then verse 10 will help us to recognize God's red line. Now, verse 10 can be difficult to understand because of two principles. First, there is sin that is forgivable, and second, there is sin that is unforgivable. And Jesus said in verse 10, 
everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. But I love the way the Message Bible puts it, because we all know what it means to badmouth someone. But the good news is that if someone badmouths Jesus out of ignorance or a misunderstanding of him, then that is sin that God can and will forgive. But notice the key words are out of ignorance or a misunderstanding. And a good example of this is the forgiveness that Jesus offered the people who taunted and laughed at him while he was hanging on the cross. And his response was simply, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, some of us may have bad-mouthed Jesus before we came to really know him or accept him as our Savior. But as soon as we fully understood who he was and what he has done for us, we repented and received forgiveness. Now, the second half of this verse is where the difficulty comes in. Whereas in the previous statement, we can get a pass for forgiveness if we badmouth Jesus out of ignorance. But there is no pass or forgiveness to be gotten if we knowingly attack the Holy Spirit. And notice the key words, knowingly attack, because that is God's red line. And it is where the term blasphemy of the Holy Spirit comes from. Now, a good example of this might be when the Pharisees so fervently opposed Jesus as the Messiah that they attributed the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus to be in the works of Satan. And I get chills just saying that. And finally, we come to an encouragement on your handout on how to respond correctly when faced with hostility or persecution. And Jesus said in verse 11, when they drag you into their meeting places or into police courts and before judges, don't worry about defending yourselves. Jesus was preparing his disciples for persecution because he knew that they would be dragged before the various religious and political leaders and forced to defend their faith. In fact, this happened shortly after Jesus' ascension into heaven when Peter and John were arrested and hauled before the Jewish Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Now, also notice the help that was promised during these times of persecution. Jesus says, don't worry about defending yourself, what you will say or how you will say it. The right words will be there. The Holy Spirit will give you the right words when the time comes. So when Peter and John were arrested and hauled, and hauled before the Sanhedrin, Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, began to testify about Jesus in spite of the pressure that they were under. And the same was true for the Apostle Paul when he was arrested and brought before the various officials. And each time the Holy Spirit would give him the words to preach about Jesus, even though it was forbidden. It was a great opportunity to acknowledge Jesus before others. And although Jesus' promise is what's particularly directed to the apostles, it also applies in principle to all of his disciples. And we can trust the Holy Spirit to help us too whenever we speak for Jesus Christ. Now, we may feel inadequate or ill-prepared or not very knowledgeable, but that is not the point here. Just show up and tell what you know about Jesus, and the Holy Spirit will take it from there. Now, I want to close by leaving you with a modern-day example of Luke chapter 12, verses 8 through 12, from a movie that I recently watched several months ago, and I could not stop thinking about it. And the more I prepared for this week's sermon, the more this movie kept coming into my mind. And Infidel is a thrilling, action-packed movie that follows this man, Doug, who is a popular Christian blogger, accused of being a spy, which he is not. It's inspired by a true story. Infidel opens in Iran with a man on the brink of being executed before a firing squad. When the trigger is pulled, the movie cuts away to six months earlier in Washington, D.C., 
where Doug is picking up his wife, Liz, from work at the State Department. Doug and Liz head to a graduation party for their close Muslim friend's daughter. And something happens to the daughter, which I will not spoil for you in case you watch it. But a week later, Doug and Liz are preparing for Doug to head to Cairo, Egypt. He's been invited there to talk about recent uprising in Egypt, and strangely, he was also asked to share about his faith, which will turn out to be a setup. Liz pleads with Doug not to preach about his faith in Egypt because she's afraid for his safety. And Liz's attitude is also tied to an accident that they experienced where Liz lost her faith in God. And cutting back to Cairo, Doug is on the stage answering the interviewer's questions, and he begins a conversation about his faith. And when they get on the subject of Jesus, Doug boldly tells them that Jesus is God. And you can imagine, that causes chaos in this mostly Muslim audience. And Doug is escorted back to his hotel where he's being flooded by the press. And in the elevator, Doug meets a man who is visibly upset at Doug for coming to his country and trying to convert people to Christianity. And Doug is later kidnapped, and he would rather die than denounce his faith that Jesus is God. And when Liz realizes that the U.S. government has no intention of helping her to get Doug back home safely, she boards a flight, heads to the Middle East to try and save Doug's life. Now, this movie also has some other strong Christian and moral elements of helping to save others, and it's a great depiction of a loving marriage. However, due to foul language and violence, the Christian movie guy advises extreme caution for younger audience, but they still highly recommend the movie because it is real-life Christianity in many other countries. Now, with this background, I'm going to play the trailer for you, and there are several scenes that will relate to Luke chapter 12. First is Doug's interview in Cairo depicts verses 8 and 9, and Liz's anger towards God depicts verse 10. At the end of the movie, it's a great depiction of verses 11 and 12 about not defending ourselves. Let's watch. You started this. We're going to finish it. He's a good people. Now, I've known Mr. Rossini for some time now. Have you ever seen him exhibit extremist behaviors or attitudes? What? The man's Muslim, so you enter his house without a warrant. Islamophobia. Come with me. He's running a terrorist nerve center or recruitment website. Or am I just an Islamophobe? He won't talk to me anymore. He knows what I saw in that room. And what does that tell you? He is the one that said, go to Cairo. Talk about the faith. You're not suspicious? I'm asking you, don't go. I will call you. It's gone viral in the Middle East. That you're preaching to Muslims. Well, I was invited. No, by me, mate. Who's there? Doug! Can you hear me? He's caused an international incident. He was kidnapped. This is terrorism. The, the, the government. Not a chance. The days of Entebbe are long over. As far as the world's concerned, you've been buried. I can't give up on it. He's here, your husband. You're all CIA. The two of you set him up. Does he act as if nothing happened in Virginia? Try to get me arrested. I came here to plead for his life. It is clear you are an American spy. I didn't come here to watch you die.
We're not afraid to die. That's why we're going to win. I'm not afraid either. So did you catch what the Muslim executor said? We win because we are not afraid to die. And Doug said, I'm not afraid either. The ending has an unexpected twist that I will not spoil for you just in case you decide to watch it. But it is powerful. So if you can handle a little drama and put a filter on the language, you have a true story and a great example of Luke chapter 12, verses 8 through 12. Well, it's altar ministry time and a time of reflection. And as we close out our time, I want you to put yourself in Doug's place and answer two questions. First, would I have the boldness to do and to endure what Doug did? Could I stand before a firing squad and not deny my faith in Jesus? Now, we may not have to stand before a firing squad, but we will all face occasions to acknowledge or deny our faith in Jesus. So how will you respond? You know, it's always best to have an answer before you're faced with the question. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you once again for your word. And now, Lord, we just ask that you would increase a spirit of boldness in all of us so that when we are faced with an opportunity to acknowledge or deny you, that we will err on the side of acknowledging you. And, Lord, we just ask for integrity as we continue to, to walk in this world that's full of so much chaos that we would be able to stand and be that light and to represent you and to bring you glory. And now, Lord, we just want to yield our spirits to the leading of the Holy Spirit, that at the end of it all, Lord God, you will be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Well, as the pastors and elders are coming forward, if you have a special prayer request and would like a pastor or an elder to pray with you, come on up. They would be honored and just happy to pray with you. Or if you're struggling with your answer to these questions, come on up and talk to one of them as well. And for the rest of you, turn to someone sitting near you and ask them, how did you answer your questions and why? And then I want you to pray over each other's week this week. Now, we have some extra time, so you don't have to rush out. But I do want you to take this time to just be a blessing to someone that's sitting around you. And now may the blessings and favor of God go with you this week. Amen. <laughs>